Good evening and welcome. My name is Cara O'Sullivan and I serve the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry as Assistant Director of Continuing Education. Thanks to each of you for joining us tonight for our second continuing education webinar of the fall semester. As part of the school's mission, we offer an array of enrichment opportunities to foster Christian faith and promote lifelong learning. We do this by offering presentations such as this one, as well as online courses, videos, podcasts, and other resources for personal enrichment and professional development. Our fall courses are underway. Our next cohort of courses begin on October 7th, next week. Upcoming courses include Joy of the Gospel, Old Testament Narrative, and Ignatian Spirituality. If you are interested in learning more about our online courses or would like to enroll in a course, we will include a, a registration link in the chat. Thanks to our speaker for granting us permission to record today's webinar. Tomorrow you will receive a follow-up email with details about accessing the recording when it is ready. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. Please feel free to enter a question into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. Finally, we are also able to offer live closed captioning for today's webinar. Please click the closed captioning button on the bottom of your screen to enable this feature. Many th thanks to Dot and Carolyn, graduate students here at the STM, for providing the closed captioning for us today. Now, I invite Megan Lovett, Director of Continuing Education here at the School of Theology and Ministry to introduce our speaker. Megan. Thank you, Cara. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation, Public Health and Public Faith, Life During a Pandemic. It is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker. Father Michael Rozier of the Society of Jesus is an Assistant Professor of Health Management and Policy at St. Louis University with a secondary appointment in the Negi Center for Healthcare Ethics. Father Rozier re received his BA in Chemistry from St. Louis University in 2003, and upon graduation, he entered the Jesuits. In 2008, Father Rozier served as an ethics fellow with the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. He has earned graduate degrees in philosophy from the University of Toronto and international health from John Hopkins University and completed his MDiv and SDL here at Boston College. He was ordained to the priesthood in 2014 and in 2018, he earned his PhD in health management and policy from the University of Michigan. Will you honor us with your presence here tonight, Father Rozier? We are grateful for your willingness to speak to us on such a timely and important topic. Welcome. Thank you so much, Megan. It is a pleasure to join uh, everybody here this evening and to have this conversation, public health and public faith. Um, I, I uh, preface my remarks by saying that I have more questions than answers, which is uh, probably similar to most people on this call. So I look forward to the conversation part uh, of, of this time together. I hope to propose to you this evening and hope to uh, engender the idea that this moment, this kind of intermediate moment uh, between uh, when the pandemic began and when we might achieve some kind of uh, normal is actually a time of tremendous grace and opportunity, uh, although it has some real challenges to it as well. And as you read in the description, I think we've come to know quite a bit about the virus over the past um, many months, but we've also come to know quite a bit about ourselves. So regarding the virus, we have moved from the unknown to better known. So let's bring ourselves back to uh, January of 2020. Uh, it seems like years ago, not months ago. Uh, I was teaching actually introduction to global health here at St. Louis University to 110 undergraduate students. Um, Little did we know that by midterms, we would be seeing each other for the last time in person and pivoting to uh, virtual learning for the balance of the semester. Now, when we began, we did not know a tremendous amount about the virus. So we did not know the, dis the disease progression. We didn't know some of the key symptoms and we found out some of the key symptoms, if you remember, the new loss of taste and smell, um, that was determined by Google searching. Um, and then of course our, our clinical encounters uh, also helped us to identify uh, what kind of symptoms uh, were key to this disease. That, that is something that we needed months to figure out. 
Um, and one, one thing about the kind of moving from the unknown to known is that we have seen science in real time. We have shared um, the progress of science together, uh, which I think people who may not have been involved in directly themselves might have thought of it as a more straight line process. But it is incredibly messy when uh, we try to uh, negotiate different learnings with each other to try to reconcile uh, competing studies and to figure out what might be true and the degree of probability or certainty around certain ideas. Um, that has made a lot of people uncomfortable, quite honestly. And I think it's because uh, we don't have uh, as clear of a public understanding of how science actually works. We think it's a much more straight line definitive process than it actually is. So we have this study of the disease progression. We also didn't remember, did not know a whole lot about the transmission of the virus. So initially we were thinking it, it was transmitted by what are called fomites, these, the, the surfaces that we might touch, the, the groceries that we bring in or the countertops in our kitchens, doorknobs. Um, it can be transmitted that way, but it is very, very unlikely to be so. Now we know it is respiratory droplets. Um, we also didn't know about the, about the transmission, about whether asymptomatic individuals could transmit the virus. We now know, of course, that uh, asymptomatic transmission, those people who aren't displaying um, the, the flu-like symptoms, uh, still can transmit the virus um, in, a, in a pretty substantial way. And so now we know it's even if we're feeling okay, we might be putting people at risk because we might be because we might have the virus and be transmitting it. So all of these things we, we came to know over the course of uh, many months, mitigation strategies. If you remember, of course, we, we told people initially that we didn't need to wear masks. Now we know that that was uh, not the right advice and it was driven by a couple assumptions about asymptomatic transmission uh, and the desire um, to reserve the PPE, the personal protective equipment for our healthcare providers. So there were some scientific and probably some sociological or political reasons. Uh, social distancing, we didn't know that out, being outdoors mitigated it um, so much, uh, as much as it does. And of course, we're coming to know, hopefully, much more about what it will take to eradicate this disease. And that is the kind of hope that we all have, that a couple, uh, at least one, but maybe a couple of the vaccines in efficacy trials right now um, might actually uh, be effective, um, effective enough to uh, justify the production and the distribution of vaccines. So over these past couple months, um, taking ourselves back to February and now to October, uh, we had a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And it's not like the uncertainty has disappeared, uh, but we have certainly come to know quite a bit more about this disease and the way um, uh, it behaves uh, in our world. At the same time, we are moving almost in the opposite direction when it came to our worshiping communities and our faith communities. So we are moving from the very familiar, the comfortable, uh, to what are we going to do now? How do we live this reality, uh, whether it be around worship? Uh, so as a priest, I had several weddings uh, during this time that just had to get suspended. One has been rescheduled, I did one of them two weeks ago, but others have yet to be even rescheduled. Uh, baptisms, of course, Eucharist, uh, it was what was the one that captured, I think, uh, our conversation and imagination on the most, uh, most regular way. But we, we were trying to figure out, okay, what do we do in the absence of being able to gather together in person? Uh, and then when we can gather together in person and there are restrictions, what does that look like? How do we do it well? Uh, also, our, our sense of community, how we are um, living together. Um, that was disrupted in a very, uh, very significant way, whether it be around um, the times before or after mass uh, or some kind of small faith community, uh, other elements that were then had, we either had to suspend them or we had to go uh, to virtual uh, encounters, which uh, I think uh, most of us would say is a less desirable version of being in um, community when we would like that option of being in person. We also were moving from the familiar to the unfamiliar in terms of service and community engagement. Uh, so what does it look like to be in conversation with our brothers and sisters in our community, especially those in most need? Uh, how can we do that uh, effectively at a time when physical distancing, uh, those personal connections that we have with uh, fellow volunteers and the communities uh, that we so desire to serve is, uh, is disrupted? And then our, our formation. Uh, whether it be um, the formation around an RCIA program 
or um, uh, formation around uh, other sacraments, uh, whether it be our um, uh, faith formation for our children. Um, all of the things that we traditionally had known, suddenly we were asking, what does this look like in a time of a pandemic? The other thing that um, was, was very clear early on, and I think is even clearer right now, is there are elements of our society that we certainly knew about, but that COVID put into much fuller relief for us. Uh, one of those was about um, the racial and ethnic disparities uh, in our communities. So we need only look at the difference in COVID hospitalization rates uh, or COVID mortality rates. Uh, and you can see here that, uh, the, that this is just for uh, the state of Georgia at one snapshot in time, but even though the black community is only 32% of the population, they were then 83% of the hospitalizations. And this is something that was happening in every uh, local jurisdiction, every state, um, and it's because um, of, the, uh, of the opportunity and the determinants of health, as we would call them, uh, are unfairly distributed. Uh, we, could, we could look at a lot of other uh, ideas around education. So when we went to remote learning, we recognized the digital divide that uh, did exist in our community, but was put in again to fuller relief by COVID, that, that some um, communities of children uh, had a very much easier time moving into remote learning than others. Uh, or we could look at unemployment. So uh, we always see a disparity in unemployment uh, between black, white, and the Latino population in this country, unfortunately. Uh, the, what COVID did to the unemployment rates, though, of course, was a differential impact. And we see that the Latino community um, in, in our country suffered the, the greatest burden uh, as it relates to unemployment in response to COVID. So again, all of these things, the digital divide, uh, the disparities in employment status and the vulnerability around employment or housing or health, um, food security, all of those things, we could look at who are the essential workers in our community. Typically, we talk about um, the essential workers around healthcare providers, uh, first responders. But now we realize, oh my gosh, our, health, our, our essential workers are the people who stock our grocery stores, uh, the people who uh, do Instacart, the people who dis deliver Amazon packages. And there is a difference in privilege between the people uh, who can order Instacart or Postmates or Amazon and the people who are delivering uh, those goods and services to individuals. And so that also continues to have uh, a differential impact. So it was always there in our society, uh, but we, but COVID-19 has put it into full, fuller relief. So even as we're thrust into the unfamiliar around the virus and around our faith, I think we're not just learning about the virus, but coming to know more about ourselves, both, both as individuals and as members uh, of our communities. Um, and there is, there's a part to lament around this. So these uh, uh, disparities, these um, rooted in uh, racism in our community primarily uh, is, um, is something to lament, absolutely to cry, work against. It is also very helpful for us to know more clearly that this is not a false narrative, that this has always been with us. Uh, and in order to remedy the situation, it is, it is not just going to happen by luck or chance or with time, that it has to be actively uh, worked through. And so uh, the, the insights, um, as, uh, as we look at public health and public faith, I think we have uh, interesting insights um, back and forth between each other. So in public health, in, in medicine, we talk about the etiology of disease, which is the progression. So we look at when we're susceptible to disease, uh, when we have a displayed symptoms, so when we actually have the disease, when we have symptoms, and when we've recovered or unfortunately have died. So this is what we call the etiology of disease. And one of the things I've been thinking about is that the etiology of the disruption of our public faith. And so we look at um, modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So the things that you can change and the things that you can't change. So when we look at cardiac disease, there are, we have genetic makeup or age that we can't change, but then there are health behaviors around smoking and high blood pressure um, that, that we might be able to change. The same thing, I think, about our public faith activities. So my question, uh, as somebody who, has, uh, who is working in parishes, working with couples, working with parents, um, what made us so susceptible uh, to this moment and not being able to engage the faith communities in the way that we likely should have? So what made it so difficult uh, to pivot to 
virtual worship? What made it so difficult for people um, to not be able to pray at home, to have that uh, fundamental uh, church as the home? Uh, and, to, and to take time to maybe reinforce that idea. What made us so susceptible um, to the idea that people have fallen away from worship in such a regular way? And I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves uh, in a very critical manner, um, because there are likely things that we could have done in the equivalent of stopping smoking or uh, exercising more. There are more things that we could have done as communities of faith to make sure that people had the spiritual resources to be able to make this move better than we did better than we did so looking at that susceptibility to this moment then we had what i call the onset of, of symptoms as we made this move uh, as a community uh, of faith and th that was largely characterized in my opinion by discord um, and a lack of charity around how we are going to move through this time together uh, so whether it be whether we should gather in church or not, whether we should receive communion uh, on the tongue or not, you know, all of those things, that there, there was uh, an unfortunate level of uh, vitriol that appeared uh, among the conversations. So the question for me is, um, when we see this onset of symptoms, this onset of discord, A, what could we have done before this happens to make it less likely to happen? And then uh, what can we do now? to make um, the symptoms diminish, uh, to go into that stage of recovery, to find ourselves more closely knit together, more woven together as a community of faith as a result of this, rather than accepting the discord as a fait accompli. Because that does not have to be the way it is. We can actively work uh, to find that stage of recovery. Uh, and so here we have that beautiful image of Pope Francis uh, in St. Peter's Square uh, leading us in prayer. And that, that has to be one of the fundamental pieces of how we move through this together. It has to be grounded in a community of faith and a community of prayer. Uh, there's just no other way that we can move through this. But for me, uh, with my public health background, this idea of an etiology kind of analyzing um, both, the, um, both the challenges and the opportunities uh, related to worship, service, community, and formation. Uh, has been pretty important. The other piece, the insight of public health is we have this idea of acute or chronic disease. And so we have some things that are acute um, that are uh, temporarily onset. And so we might think of a broken bone uh, as an acute disability that hopefully will heal and will be back to relative normal. Um, but then we do have things that are chronic conditions, things that we do our best to manage but our life is never going to be to go back to the way it was before that particular condition um, came about. So you might think of diabetes as a chronic condition that we learn to live with, and hopefully we learn to live well with. It, does, it, ha it changes our life, but it doesn't have to totally uh, disrupt everything that we are hoping to do with our lives. And so that's the question I think we have as a community of faith. As we start looking forward, it, uh, asking ourselves, okay, what are those things that we do definitely want to go back to? Uh, the, the acute disruptions that we say, you know what, this was an essential part of who we are and we, we want to retain that. And what are the chronic things that um, we, we are okay modifying uh, because you know, it, it just was not bringing us the amount of life that, that we had originally imagined. So we have to honestly assess both why we're vulnerable to this as a people of faith and determine what um, we can do um, what's, what, what is essential to moving forward and what can be reimagined. Now, the opposite direction, so those were kind of public health insights for public faith. Public faith also has insights uh, for public health. And I think one of the uh, elements of that is around trust. So I put up here the details of a, of a Pew survey. This is from 2016. It has been replicated um, two years ago, I think, 2018. And some things like scientists have actually increased over time. But generally speaking, we've seen an erosion of trust in institutions, professions, organizations uh, over the past several decades. The Catholic Church, of course, is one of those institutions where trust has been eroded uh, and for very obvious reasons. So we, uh, as a community of faith, I think can help uh, be a, uh, a warning sign to the scientists 
who are trying to figure out how do I communicate in a, in a transparent way to the public right now about what we're facing. So I, I put up here um, the uh, hydroxychloroquine, which created, has created um, a, a significant controversy within the scientific and political communities uh, in terms of what can be trusted or not, or the convalescent plasma. One of my concerns, quite honestly, is around vaccines. Uh, so we have done safety trials for a number of vaccines. We're now doing efficacy trials for a number of them. There is political pressure uh, to have a vaccine available before election day. Uh, and I think we have, um, we, uh, the scientific community um, must look at how trust has been eroded uh, in media, in politics, in religion, and say, we cannot have this done for the scientific community as well. And resisting that political pressure, uh, because once that trust has been eroded, it takes a very, very long time to recover it. And so if we go public with a vaccine that has not been shown to be as effective as we would like, and we try to um, insist that people get vaccinated, then when we actually have not only a vaccine for COVID, but, but other things that the scientific community needs people to trust in, it is gonna be much more difficult um, to, to have people uh, respond uh, to the requests of the scientific community. We, we have seen this globally uh, whenever we have, um, uh, th there have been accusations of um, uh, individuals trying to do global health work, either being embedded with the CIA and therefore vaccinations plummeted in certain areas of the world because there was a question of whether uh, it was, um, uh, it was duplicitous or not. So I, um, th this idea of trust, I think, is incredibly important as we move forward. The other uh, big thing that I think public, public faith can offer public health is this moral vision for the world. So if, if we look at um, even pre-pandemic uh, concerns, loneliness, isolation, despair was a major concern, uh, especially around uh, the elderly and around individuals in their teens and 20s. So they, they manifest themselves in very different ways, uh, but it's a crisis for both populations. And the crisis for the younger group uh, manifests itself uh, largely around interactions uh, with technology, uh, not having the kind of um, social connections uh, that, that, that would make them more resilient in times of crisis. And for the elderly, it manifests itself primarily by physical isolation. Um, and so whenever we uh, talk about how we're going to move forward, I think one of the questions that communities of faith can be incredibly helpful with is what does it look like to bridge, uh, to bridge worlds? How do we make sure uh, that the most vulnerable in our community, including um, the elderly who are facing isolation, uh, how do we make sure that they are included uh, in our moral vision for how we move forward? Uh, because quite honestly, um, we are very comfortable as a society, as Pope Francis would say, not only discarding material things, but discarding uh, people that we consider no longer worthy of our time or resources. And so uh, public health in general has a, um, has a great um, grounding in social justice, uh, but it is what I would consider a relatively thin notion of justice. So we have uh, a, um, great goals around eliminating health disparities, um, making sure that people have equal access to opportunity, but having a sense of who we are as people and the kind of non-physical elements of our personhood uh, is an area where public health can quite frankly grow. The other um, you know, element of this moral vision, uh, revisiting a topic that I've already talked about in terms of disparities. Here's a statistic around the digital divide. And so dial-up access, um, so 27% of our American, Indian, and Alaska Native uh, residents did not have access, uh, reliable internet access uh, when this crisis began. And so that has implications for um, the workplace, it has implications uh, for education, it has implications for health, of course. Um, and the, um, the timing of uh, this crisis with the uh, murder of uh, George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, uh, and the kind of uh, recognition of racial injustice in this country, uh, the two have to be held together uh, because or in order 
um, to help resolve either one, we uh, have to uh, rely on the insights of the other. So faith communities, uh, my claim is have, uh, have a lot to offer public conversation about moving forward. And that comes from our experiences of failure. So certainly uh, the sexual abuse crisis that uh, destroyed much of the trust that people had in the institutional church um, that is um, an unquestionable failure that has made it more difficult uh, to, uh, to make uh, moral claims about how we think society ought to move forward. And so we can talk to uh, other people like the scientific community uh, about how to avoid those kind of situations because it will compromise effectiveness uh, into the future, uh, but also places of strength. So uh, our appreciation for um, the multi-dimensional uh, human nature, uh, appreciating the, the social, spiritual, psychological, and physical realities, um, and uh, the, the preferential option uh, that we have for those people who are most vulnerable in our community, uh, that it is not just a matter of reducing health disparities, but that it is intentionally directing resources uh, to the people in our community who are in the greatest need. So, so I'm going to take a moment um, after this kind of rapid fire to appreciate uh, that there has been tremendous loss, loss during this pandemic. So here we see just a couple of the faces uh, of individuals who have passed away uh, of the now over 200,000 people just in this country who have passed away from this virus. And it will likely um, more than double over the coming months. So th these are people who um, are wives, husbands, mothers, fathers, daughters, sons. And we should lament the loss of these individuals, these members of our community. So there was, there has been, and there is currently a tremendous amount being taken. Uh, we can also think of our experience of the Eucharist. That was something that we might um, uh, frame as being taken from us. It was something that, that was important for our lives, and we could no longer experience it in the way um, that we had come uh, to love and enjoy. So those kind of losses, uh, both people in our lives um, and those uh, opportunities, whether it be uh, getting together for those wedding celebrations, whether it be stopping by and seeing a neighbor, whether it be I have a grandmother in a nursing home uh, and I've had to visit her through the window for the past uh, many months and not being able um, to, to give her a hug, uh, to tell her how much uh, I love her uh, when we're in the same room. That is tremendously painful. Uh, at the same time, we have been given a tremendous amount during this moment. So I here have a screenshot from another alum of Boston College, Jeremy Zippel, who is down in Belize at St. Martin's Parish um, in Belize City. Uh, he put together this amazing Palm Sunday uh, celebration uh, by having people video themselves uh, singing a processional hymn. And then he posted it and it has gotten uh, tens of thousands, uh, if not hundreds, what do we say, 50,000 views just on this one page. Um, and so there, there was this, and there, there is this tremendous burst of creativity in how we are um, uh, engaging as faith communities. And that is something to hold alongside the loss we've had. Um, and so we as Catholics should be very good at the both and. And, and so th this is one of those opportunities to practice the both and. Yes, we can lament what has been lost, and we can also celebrate what has been given without diminishing the reality of either one of those things. I think we've also grown in appreciation for our sacramental community, uh, our, the, the, the rhythm of our faith life. You know, we have um, talked to a very, um, not just talked, um, we, we have lived the reality of being an incarnate people. So our sacramental nature, uh, we talk about uh, needing to be uh, embodied. And so when we, that there might have been conversations, oh, well, can't we just um, do this? Uh, can't, can't you hear confession over uh, Zoom? Or can't we do a wedding with the presider uh, somewhere else? So no, this is, this is an embodied faith. 
the, the incarnation uh, gives us a glimpse into, into what we're all about. And so I think this might have been a moment to more deeply appreciate it. One of the things I was um, giving some seminars, uh, some webinars to people running liturgical worship in their communities, and they were you know, um, talking about all the things that they couldn't do anymore, which I think is very fair. And one of the questions I asked was, how much time have we spent uh, in gratitude for being able to return at all? In gratitude, even though we have to distance during mass, we're, we, most of us can go back to mass uh, in the churches now. And if we skipped over that point of gratitude, I think that's a, that's a real missed opportunity. Uh, we also have, have seen tremendous generosity in our communities, uh, whether it be the donations of uh, PPEs or healthcare providers or the healthcare providers themselves, the number of um, people that I work with who uh, went to the hospital and then did not see their kids for weeks, they slept in a different part of their house because they were afraid of infecting their children or their spouse. That level of sacrifice for each other during this time uh, just shows the, the great generosity and uh, the understanding, I think, that has been engendered during this time, the growing awareness of uh, the discrimination in our communities and the way that it has not only affected um, the reality of the virus, but also uh, so many other realities um, in our society. So again, this kind of, this both and uh, that we as Catholics should be very good at uh, practicing that during this time of COVID. And uh, one maybe last uh, observation before we move into questions is uh, I've pulled this phrase from a beautiful prayer from um, Teilhard de Chardin that many people might be familiar with called patient trust. Um, and it goes above all trust in the slow work of God that we're naturally quite impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We would like to skip the intermediate steps and he goes on and says, and yet it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability. This prayer has been incredibly helpful to me over the past six or seven months, um, both as a professional uh, in the public health world and as a pastor uh, in the church, uh, because I think we can all want to skip to the next stage to figure out, okay, when we have an effective vaccine, what are we gonna do then? which are great questions to ask. I think we should be asking those questions and planning for them. But if we are doing that at the expense of asking the important questions about now, we are doing ourselves and those we are asked to serve a tremendous disservice. Uh, it's our obsession with technology and uh, simpler changes uh, because somebody else is doing the vaccines, right? Somebody else is trying to figure that out and whenever it's figured out, we'll all get it. Great. And so I can push my energy uh, into that space. Whereas now, social change, the kind of things that are required of all of us, have a cost for all of us. And so appreciating this intermediate stage and the things that we can all contribute, uh, I think is incredibly important for us um, and to not try to skip the intermediate stages to get to the end. Um, I think also in our personal lives, this intermediate stage requires an element of vulnerability rather than defiance. So there are, I think, parts of all of us uh, that would like to um, push back against the reality that we're facing. And insofar as that's you know, reasonable and justified, I think that is fine. But insofar as it's just a matter of us trying to avoid the genuine vulnerability that, that this moment is calling out of us, uh, I think it is um, not really the best way forward. And so this has reminded us all, hopefully, um, of the social connections that we so deeply love um, and are important to our lives and that we don't have as much control over our lives as we would like to believe. Uh, and this has just put it again into crisper, clearer belief for us. And just in general, that, that the, the social lives as well so again, our temptation can be toward independence. So how do I secure myself and my family? How do I, and that is absolutely a question we should be asking. So I'm not trying to say that any of these things are bad, but they're bad when they're done to the exclusion or uh, in an unhealthy way of the, other, uh, of the other possibility. Because now is a moment, this intermediate moment is 
a time to consider the solidarity that we were invited to before COVID, but are invited to in a um, more significant way, I think, during this time. Um, and hopefully we emerge from this particular pandemic more acutely aware uh, of, the, of the discrimination uh, that exists in our society and the solutions that might have already always been there, but that we were unwilling to consider. So uh, it's, it's tempting to rush through these intermediate stages uh, because they're uncomfortable. Uh, there is much less known about them and it's, it's easier to, ID, uh, to deal with an imagined uh, unknown than this very real unknown uh, because we can have slightly more control uh, over that in the future. Uh, but we need to be asking what is asked of us now in this moment. And that takes um, kind of a retrospective character, um, asking again, going back to that slide about susceptibility, why were we so vulnerable at this moment? Uh, but then also, uh, what, what will it look like to both live this moment well and to live in the, in the post-vaccine, uh, hopefully new normal well? So just a, a brief summary, and I look forward to the discussion um, that we'll have over the next 20 minutes or so, that we are growing in knowledge, not just of the virus, but of who we are. So if we think of those things about the virus around transmission, but I think we've, we've also um, come to know about our social connectedness and the vulnerability that, that we all uh, have had, uh, but are more acutely aware of now. That communities of faith and broader society, especially the scientific community, can gain insight from each other uh, about this moment. Uh, and there is tremendous grace in this intermediate stage. Uh, it's, it's important for us to hold together both the lament and the celebration uh, and to use all of those things to inform both living this moment well and what will look like to live well in the future. So that is the uh, end of my presentation. We can come back to these slides if necessary, uh, but right now I look forward to the conversation um, that we'll have. Thank you so much, Father Rozier. Your presentation was excellent. We've had some great questions in the Q&A section as well. Um, so the first question that was posted has to do with um, how do we worship during these this strange COVID times? And um, the particular question is how can we regain our worship with liturgical worship music and a fuller community unity? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and so when, when um, considering these uh, Concerning the question around uh, our faith communities, I think it's important, uh, again, to hold things in tension. That uh, I think the struggle around not being able to be together at the Eucharist is, is coming from a very holy place. Uh, clearly, those are holy desires that we are tapping into to be together. Um, and then um, the, the question here is how do we um, uh, regain our liturgical worship? So insofar as the question is asked, how do we uh, regain what has had been in February 2020. Uh, I, I don't know if that's um, uh, the question I'd, I'd like to ask and answer, but how do we live this moment well given the realities of COVID? Um, and so we've seen that it requires, you know, practically speaking, some social distancing in church. It requires mask wearing. It might require us um, to not have those gatherings before and after in the way that we um, typically do, but also there's new opportunities. And so um, the possibility of either Bible studies, small faith communities, um, family faith formation, um, I think is new. So I, I, I can say, um, you know, early in the pandemic, my nephews live here in, uh, some of my nephews live here in St. Louis. I could no longer see them uh, because we were trying to distance. Uh, so I ended up reading them Bible stories via Zoom. So we would pull up, I would share my screen, they would gather um, six and four years old, I read through it together. It, it gave their parents a little time to work. <laughs> and it also allowed me uh, to be with my nephews in, in a way that I never did pre-COVID. And so I think there are some um, opportunities to both achieve community in creative ways and to do liturgical worship, um, liturgical worship well. Thank you. Um, another question um, was posted about how um, access to the Eucharist was definitely impacted by the pandemic and that has caused us to reflect on those who, who don't have regular access to the Eucharist 
for different reasons, um, as well as the need for, you know, lay women and lay men to start, you know, preaching or posting, um, you know, has this led to more experiences and solidarity and inclusion in our church and society? Yeah, so uh, again, um, that, so this, is, this was one of the key learnings um, for me as a minister of the church um, around the Eucharist. So seeing again that, that deep and holy desire uh, to gather around um, the altar and the word proclaimed and in a community to recognize Christ in, in all of those places, um, what was, was very heartening. What was disheartening at, the, at that moment was um, seeing that we have clearly um, not given the lay faithful um, the tools they need to pray well in a context outside of the Eucharist. And so, it, yes, it is the source and summit. Yes, it is an incredibly important moment uh, in our church. Um, and, so here's that book, and we have tremendous resources for very nourishing prayer that can be lay-led, um, that I just don't think we have uh, explored sufficiently uh, because, and so that's what I'm talking about in terms of the susceptibility. So what made us so susceptible at this moment for people like um, just uh, being thrown into a state of crisis? And part of it was not actually mining the tremendous resources for lay-led uh, prayer that have always existed. Um, and so that, 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 I think, is a great opportunity for us both now and moving forward. Because if our only solution um, is, to, is to go back and... I'm gonna be very sad if once we have the vaccine uh, and we can gather back together in the, in the dense church environment that, that we don't reconsider, okay, what other opportunities did we miss before this that we need to be taking more seriously now? Did that answer the question, Megan? I'm sorry, I kind of forgot the question. I think so, but our, our attendee can repost if, they, okay. if she has sorry. a follow-up question. Um, so speaking of the vaccine, I know that one of the challenges that I have faced during um, this pandemic is managing different levels of anxiety that my friends and family have. Um, and so one of our attendees has posted, um, you know, how would you address parish planning teams who want to wait to move forward until a vaccine is available? Um, so when you're planning, you know, different people have different thoughts on, on when, when is it safe to do so. Yeah, absolutely. And so when I've um, uh, been working with parishes on this question, I, I, two, two main pieces uh, have to be present. One, uh, having a team that trusts and pray with each, prays with each other before the pandemic was crucial because if that was not there, then uh, that kind of inability to work through difficult moments like this, it's, 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 um, it's nearly impossible to start that process now. And so it, it reminds us of the importance of creating trusting teams in our communities and to prayer, prayerful teams. The other piece of it that has um, uh, you know, been um, clear, I'm gonna try, this, try to say this as, as gently as possible, um, but there are two ways of being anti-science at this moment. So uh, I think there are anti-science people who refuse to social distance, refuse to wear masks, refuse, you know, for either political reasons or, you know, don't trust the scientific community. I think there's a whole lot of reasons why people wouldn't trust science for that narrative. I think, quite honestly, there is an anti-science um, uh, movement on the other end that is driven likely by anxiety and uncertainty. And so, not trusting that we can we can social distance uh, and we're not at risk. We can wear masks uh, and it mitigates the risk. We can, in certain places of the country, do outdoor worship. And, it, and so there are ways to safely do it and that comes from studies. I would say that that was not true in April. We did not know what was actually safe back then. And of course, we're always learning, so there might be mistakes. Uh, and if, if it's coming from an anxiety around we just don't know yet. Um, we don't know perfectly, but we know pretty well. And so um, for those parishes or parish teams that are struggling with, well, wait until we have a perfect solution. Um, you know, as, as a Jesuit uh, um, uh, with discernment of spirits, I would, I would ask them to lead themselves in, in a group discernment around what, what, what's the motivation um, or what's the 
what's the movement that is causing us uh, to, to be so anxious there? Um, it could come from a very fine place uh, or it could come from the evil spirit. Thank you. Um, so in line with what you're just speaking about, uh, different, different approaches to science, um, an attendee posted, how might we respond to members of our communities who say, quote, God will protect us and then refuse to engage in mitigation practices? Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I would say that, um, that God is a God of abundance. Uh, and God is a God of generosity. There is no doubt about it. And we need only look at the brilliant women and men that um, have helped us recognize the way that the disease is transmitted, how it can be mitigated, uh, how it might spread in the community. Um, like that is part of God's generosity. That is part of God's abundance. So will God protect us? Absolutely. I think God has done so. Um, not, I mean, obviously not, um, uh, we have, um, realities where people have passed away, uh, but the idea that um, that it will be uh, that protection will come in non-human form when God has already has already considered uh, invited us to consider the fact that it's coming in human form. Um, uh, that, that that's what I would try to invite people to consider. Like, wh what are the gifts? What are the things that God has already given us that um, that um, look like protection? Thank you. Um, one of our attendees works as a chaplain and um, has experienced the difficulty of comforting families who aren't able to be present with their family members during their illness and, you know, a potential death from the from the from COVID. And so um, he was looking for any insight or advice on on how you can comfort grieving families during such difficult times. Mm. Yeah. Um, that is uh, a great question, and I would also uh, invite if there are other chaplains or pastoral care workers on this uh, webinar to, uh, to, to respond to this as well. Um, so, um, you know, in, in these moments, um, we have um, uh, certainly rules and guidelines that we need to follow. Uh, I, I do think that there are I'm not encouraging him to, to break uh, the hospital's rules. Um, but, but I do think that um, there are some times uh, when uh, a quick visit, uh, and if, especially if people know the risk they are taking uh, to be with their family member who might be passing away alone, um, if, if people are making informed decisions uh, and then being able to take that action, I, I, I think that is, um, that is one piece of it. That doesn't get to the pastoral care um, of the people who have actually had uh, people pass away during this time. Um, so I, I think inviting people to um, both, of course, um, uh, consider um, the, the gift that their life has been, um, but then also um, grappling with, so what is my response to that? What would my loved one likely have wanted me to do? And so um, sometimes we find comfort um, in maybe reaching out to those other people in our community that we know are lonely, the people who aren't hospitalized, who we can sit on their front porch and visit. Um, so what are the opportunities that are presenting as, as a potential source of healing? Uh, and, and I think there are um, those that uh, uh, somebody in pastoral care can invite uh, people in that position to um, to think about. Thank you. Um, another question is just about the the words that we use to describe, you know, the mitigation efforts that we're doing. You know, social distance versus physical distance. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I um, certainly. I, words uh, absolutely matter. I um, actually study mortal rhetoric. That's one of the. Uh, uh, areas that I spend a great deal of time on. So the, the push to use physical distancing rather than social distancing, uh, I, think, I think was a, um, a very good one. Um, I, I, I don't know if I slipped into it and used um, social distancing here. Uh, but yeah, I, I do think um, words matter uh, because they, they train us how to think about the world. So I would, uh, I would fully support the idea of physical distancing. 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to just revisit to when you were talking about, you know, what are essential components of our faith life that, you know, we should, we should really hold on to moving forward. Do you have thoughts on what you think are essentials that we should hold on to? Yeah. So, um, this, this was one of the topics where I felt like I had a better question than I do answers. Um, and one of the reasons that I uh, hesitate to um, even provide some initial answers is because I do think it needs to come from our communities of faith. Um, and I think um, it's going to take some real work. And, um, you know, I, I would say, but one of the guiding uh, principles is to uh, strong of a word, but um, ways to think about it for me is uh, what are the things that brought us kind of the most amount of pain uh, whenever, whenever it was taken away? That, that's likely a sign that uh, it was really important to us. Um, so I, but I, I think also of, um, so those essential nature, um, but then also what, what was kind of um, uh, missing in a lot of this? Um, I think um, the, yeah, yeah, actually, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, go into that if that's okay. That's okay. I think, um, you know, especially where we are in Boston, I think there's a lot of fear around the weather turning colder. Mm -hmm. If you have thoughts on, you know, how we can, can continue growing in our public faith and public health as, as the weather turns. Yeah, this is, this is a real, real challenge. Um, and so, uh, again, both as um, you know, a uh, somebody who goes uh, and does uh, supply ministry at parishes on a regular basis, uh, but then also teaching on a university. Uh, so at St. Louis University, we have been very fortunate uh, to have very few infections, and it's largely because I think people can hang out outside pretty safely. Um, so I can say, as a Jesuit community, um, in July, uh, I was talking with my community. I do spiritual direction. We all do spiritual direction outside now. Um, we have um, uh, gatherings of guys, so we might grill out, whatever, outside. But we didn't have a patio uh, or, I said, a fire pit. I said, so, you know, in December, January, February, here in Missouri, we are going to need um, structures, physical structures that allow us to be outside on a more regular basis, whether it be for spiritual direction or to visit with friends that we can't otherwise bring into our home. Um, and so I think we need to be thinking about physical structures that work well in this environment. Of course, you know, as, as we think about that, people who have the resources to do that, and there are people who don't have the resources to do that. And so we're, uh, we could be exacerbating disparities. Um, and so maybe it's uh, important for our churches to be thinking about what would structures, so it, is it some kind of heated tent? Is it, is it something that allows people uh, to more safely gather together uh, in wintertime? But I think the two things that we shouldn't do uh, are to not problem solve. Like if we just say like, oh, December, January, and February, we're not gonna be able to do anything because it's too cold. Like, I don't think that is the answer. And the other thing that is not an answer is to ignore the mitigation strategies that we know are effective. So we can't say, well, it's cold, so we're just gonna go ahead, gather in a dense manner inside. Um, that is a solution for perpetuating this crisis, this pandemic. Um, so something that is neither one of those two things. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for all these great posts. I think we have time for one more. Um, so one of our attendees, she said that she's a mother to three young adults and she also is a high school teacher. And, you know, she's looking for recommendations on how to balance physical health and mental health that, mm -hmm. you know, social experiences and, and, you know, doing things are part of mental health as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I think we have seen, um, you know, quite a few um, creative um, strategies for this emerge. Um, again, so uh, my sister and my nephews live in a neighborhood here in St. Louis. Um, you know, they're small kids, but uh, their neighborhood painted rocks with little things like, um, you know, say the Pledge of Allegiance or do 10 jumping jacks, whatever. So you saw all these families who couldn't gather together but we're walking around the neighborhood and watching kids do random weird stuff uh, during the day. Uh, and it was like, 
This would never happen pre-COVID, uh, but it was good for their physical health, their mental health. And so I don't have um, any like, this is the solution to this, um, to this crisis, but I know um, that, there are, there, that there's plenty of creativity out there. Uh, and so one, one of the things that I would um, suggest doing is, you know, uh, finding an hour. Um, so this mother is three young adults and teach. Uh, so uh, find an hour. If you, if you like a glass of wine, grab a glass of wine, get on a session uh, with four of your best friends and say, we're going to spend the next hour brainstorming ideas of how we can do this well. We're going to actually commit the time and energy um, when we don't have a lot of time and energy, but committing that time and energy to that central question. Uh, I bet a mom of three who teaches high school students, if she gathered uh, a couple of her close friends, oh my gosh, is going to knock this out of the park um, because uh, that, that's the skill set that we all need. And then sharing it online to say, hey, this is what we did. Um, you know, the, the more that we can help each other through this, the better off we'll be. Thank you so much, Father Rojo, and thank you for your presentation. It's been a wonderful evening with you. Um, thank you to all of our attendees for joining us this evening. We do have four more presentations, just like this one. Our next one is in two weeks, October 15th. It's by Dr. Amy Victoria Atkins Jones. She's going to be speaking on Do Black Lives Matter to God? We hope that you're able to join us. Thank you again, Father Rojo. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank you.